On this episode of China Unscripted, we talk with a former Chinese Communist Party official turned democracy activist about his meeting with Vice President Mike Pence, how Xi Jinping faces enemies everywhere, and the future of China after the Communist Party is over. Hi, welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Joining us today is Dr. Yang Jianli, a former Tiananmen Square activist. He has a PhD in mathematics from UC Berkeley and a PhD in political economics from Harvard. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So after you went back to China in 2002 to help labor activists, you were arrested and sentenced to five years in prison. After your release, you founded Citizen Power Initiatives for China, a group that advocates for the peaceful transition to democracy in China. So... Tell us about the peaceful transition to democracy in China. How can that be achieved? Um, I think um, we need uh, people's power. Uh, we need everybody be empowered with um, the idea of human rights, democracy, and freedom. Uh, and we uh, also need the people on ground to come together uh, to um, engage in peaceful effort to try to change China and peacefully. And we are believing in nonviolence. And uh, also, we uh, need inter- international support. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we haven't seen many, many protests in China. But uh, we still need a viable opposition movement in China, uh, which is something we are working on. And uh, yes, international support is also very important for China to go to uh, democracy. So I have a question about that. China, the Chinese Communist Party is one of the most brutal authoritarian dictatorships in the world. How can nonviolent strategies affect change in that environment? Yep. Um, no matter what means you want to employ, um, you will find, um, uh, you know, the cost is very, very difficult to achieve anything uh, under this uh, very, very brutal and cunning uh, dictatorship. Uh, but uh, according to a lot, lot of uh, uh, historical experience, experiences, uh, nonviolent, uh, nonviolent protests uh, have a higher uh, prob- probability to achieve our goals. Uh, remember, uh, Chinese government is the most um, uh, powerful in military and in, in economics on earth. So if we engage in violent uh, action against it, we can only play into its hands. You know, we just uh, use the weakest uh, to, uh, to do anything against the uh, uh, strongest. This is not uh, wise. Uh, but in China, we have seen, as I just said, many, many protests. There are very, very, very few actually succeeded. It's not for uh, the purpose of um, uh, overall change China, but for you know the very local uh, uh, economic interest driven issue, some, some such as environment, environmental protection issue, and. Only the few, very few actually succeeded. They are all, all nonviolent. None of the violent protests actually have ever succeeded in China. So I believe in violence. It takes time. It it also takes determination and discipline to engage in violent uh, resistance. You mean nonviolent resistance? Nonviolence, yeah. Okay. So what would a nonviolent tactic look like? Because as you said, there's not many protests happening in China. Yeah, well, now it's um, not many protesting uh, protests are happening in China because uh, Xi Jinping has, um, you know, has uh, uh, tightened up the control over civil society. Uh, but there's still space if you really want to do something. You know, when we talk about nonviolent actions. Of movement, we have to uh, make a distinction between individual 
action and the protest and the whole movement demanding for overall change. For you know, different levels of um, uh, actions and purpose have different tactics. For individual actions, actually everybody can do something. For example, they can um, um, uh, get around the firewall to get information overseas and disseminate among the people. Uh, like episodes you know, of China and Censor. Teacher, yeah, yeah, they censor. But uh, still can find a way to get information to many, many people. That's an individual action. The individual actions, including a teacher, can send something in the classroom. Of course, the teacher would risk uh, being arrested, harassed, and any, uh, losing job, uh, something like that. But there's still some space. You, people can engage in individual actions to a certain degree. And this is the individual action. And uh, then, we, then next level would be a um, uh, uh, protest for a single issue purpose. Um, for, for example, in environmental protection. So they have to be very careful how to formulate their slogan and uh, come together to win even the people in the government to their side. Then next level would be the movement, peaceful movement demanding for overall change. You know, that takes a lot to actually for people to come together. So is this what the citizen power is in citizen power initiative? Yes, that's what we try to do. We committed to empower the people back in China in whatever way possible to help them to engage in peaceful action to uh, defend their own rights or demand for uh, political change in China. So you had mentioned the three levels, the one of being individual action and the, the second being like individual, like specific protests and the third being a, like a broader movement. Where is China right now? Uh, China, we used to have um, a lot of protests for uh, uh, one issue. It's not for overall um, change demanding. Uh, that's, um, be- that was before Xi Jinping came to power. But after the Xi Jinping um, uh, took power, the, the space has been increasingly squeezed. Now it's almost zero. So now we are, in, uh, you know, we can describe the China situation as uh, they only have a space for individual actions. Even that is very risk. Uh, it's very dangerous. There's this perception that Chinese people they won't care about things like you know, individual freedoms or democracy or, you know, civil society issues if they personally can, you know, have prosperity and things like that. What do you think of that? Uh, it's, it's not true. No matter how uh, prosperous the individual is, whether it's poor or rich, um, in the end, people are demanding for freedom. If you become a rich then you um, have more resources uh, at your disposal uh, in the society. Then you want, want to have more say in the political uh, decision-making process, locally or nationally. So uh, naturally, I think they will demand for uh, more political rights. If you are, happen to be at the bottom of society, of course, you want more um, um, share economically. And oftentimes, you will find, you know, the, the, you know the, the, the unfair system is based on unfair political system. So you, have, you want to do something about it. So I think it's not about whether people desire for uh, more political right. It is the question whether the government allow them to. You know, the government now has been uh, clamping down on their civil society, and anybody or everybody who wants to do anything, uh, even you know, put out a message online, would uh, put them in the very, very uh, dangerous situation. Um, you know, given this kind of uh, political coercion, uh, you we can only imagine 
um, it's so difficult for people to take, take action. And, you know, interme international media and a lot of observers um, always talk about, you know, how much the Chinese people want freedom or democracy or human rights. The, you know, the information they look at is the discourse online. But we cannot forget only the, uh, you know, their uh, um, ideas, or opinions allowed by the government can be freely um, expressed online. So it's very bi uh, biased. We cannot take that uh, as a reality. So I think uh, the, the, the problem is on the, on the, on the government, it's not on the people. As a matter of fact, in the past 30 years after the Tiananmen massacre, the concept of a human rights and uh, democracy and freedom, rule of law, is, you know, all these perfect uh, concepts are prevailing in people's minds. And if given any space, uh, discourse of space, they will express it. And I'm, I engage um, uh, with um, uh, the p petitioners in China uh, all the time. Uh, oftentimes, I try to minimize talking about these abstract concepts because I I was afraid, you know, I may I might you know get them to the situation where they don't know what are we talking about. But you know, it is them. Most time, it is them. Actually, they told us. We have to demand for more political rights because they understand without the political rights, you know, the, the economic system is unfair. So what I try to say, desire for freedom is no problem. The problem is how much the government wants you to do it. Right. So what you're saying is that what Chinese people are saying online is a very limited and highly censored version of what right. people in that country are actually feeling. Uh, so how do you suss out uh, what people are actually feeling and what the situation is like on the ground? Yes, we are engaging people on the ground all the time. And we know what they demand, number one. Number two, you know, there's some times when, you know, the, the, the uh, freedom uh, it, it was greater. You know, there's always a time freedom is greater than other times. Uh, when there is a space, you will see a lot, a lot of people talking about uh, the, the rights, talking about democracy, talking about uh, local uh, government corruption or, you know, all these kind of things. Right. And, and in what kind of space are you observing this now? Uh, now we are, uh, have WeChat. WeChat is a highly censored. We know that. But, you know, there's always tactics to, um, to put your lang I mean, the message there. The message may just leave for a few hours. Um, you know, sometimes as short as a few minutes. But still, the message is spread so fast. Every day, when you get on... Uh, the social media like um, um, uh, uh, WeChat, we see a lot, a lot of expressions like that. And uh, Twitter is another thing. Of course, uh, normal people in China cannot use uh, Twitter, but those who are savvy, who are savvy enough to get around firewall and uh, use this uh, technology can use the tweet Twitter. Myself, I have um, 100... Uh, 35,000 followers. Most of them are in China. So there are a lot of discussions and the communications through those uh, social media. So you think there could be much more discontent in China than people can tell from on the surface? Oh, yes, of course. So how does that go from being this underground movement to actually being something that can affect regime change? Um, yeah, that's a very, very difficult question. And um, um, for um, a dictatorship to change to democracy, it usually takes um, a few factors, few uh, conditions to come together. Number one, uh, the 
uh, general existing robust uh, discontent with the government. Uh, that is existing in, in China. Uh, the regime does not lack enemies. We see a lot, lot of them. Um, you know, uh, not only the independent um, scholars in China, dissidents, human rights activists, petitioners, Falun Gong practitioners, Uyghurs, uh, now Hong Kongers, you name it. So many of them. So we have um, so many, so many people in China who loathe this current system and uh, want change. Uh, the second factor is uh, the viable opposition. Uh, the most difficult part is to translate the people's demand uh, into a viable democracy opposition movement. We have been working for so many years for that. Um, uh, so far, we have not succeed, succeeded. And um, there are a lot, lot of um, um, reasons. Um, uh, now, I, I, I don't think I will get into it. Uh, the third uh, condition is that the cracks in the leadership of the regime. And uh, of course, the, 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 the third condition and the second one are mutually reinforce, re reinforcing. Because if we have a viable opposition, it will be more likely there is cracks in, in the government. If there is a, a cracks in the government, then more likely then we'll have a viable opposition. And the, the fourth condition is international recognition of the viable democracy movement and come to its support at a very important moment. So we need actually these are four conditions to come together. But quite unfortunately, um, after Tiananmen Square, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union has never been far away from the mind of the communist leaders. So ever since then, they have been doing everything, uh, everything possible to control society. Um, the, they put a lot of resources um, on the front line, which is preventing people from coming together, the mm -hmm. protest. Mm -hmm. If we have uh, 10,000 people in Tiananmen Square at this moment, this regime will be toppled. But we understand it. The regime understands it better. So they are trying to prevent that thing from happening. So uh, uh, because of that, because of the government's uh, tactics and uh, all the measures you know, they have been using, the resources they have been put into the so-called uh, stability preserving system, uh, the, our movement is still, after so many years, at a very, very primitive uh, stage of uh, not yet, not yet, um, not yet become a viable, uh, viable movement. So that's quite un unfortunately. In top tier cities like Beijing and Shanghai now, there are surveillance cameras everywhere. Uh, everywhere, yeah. With, with face recognition and so on. Uh, are these effective tools in preventing people from uh, coming very, out to protest before effective. they come out? Very effective. Not only um, uh, in the first tier cities uh, like Beijing and Shanghai, actually everywhere in China, even in the countryside, my hometown, that is uh, Shandong province. In the village, I, I talk to my um, uh, local, I, I mean, uh, hometown fellows all the time. They have told me that in every village, there are two to 20, for five to 20, for example, cameras in the small village to watch people. And in every classroom on university campus, there are a couple of uh, cameras. So we, yeah, so it's very difficult, very difficult, if not uh, totally impossible for people to come together to form some kind of, um, to build some kind of momentum for protest. If people only live online, 
to expressing these um, ideas, uh, this content, yes, which is very important, but still we cannot uh, effect a very, very important change. We need people to go to street, to come together. Um, but the regime is so good at controlling that. From what you're saying, it sounds like the situation is pretty hopeless. Right. So, um, it's, it's, yes, mm, it's very difficult. But I think uh, one hope is Xi Jinping not only alienate um, dissidents further, um, uh, as his predecessors did, um, but he alienates so many his comrades in the party. Uh, there are potentially a lot of cracks. And he understands that there are a lot of enemies around him, but he does not even know where, from which direction the first attack would take place. So he, of course, he, he, he's so powerful, but his situation is precarious. And, um, and I, I think with um, um, international pressure, with Hong Kong's demonstration, with the Chinese economic downturn and the uh, potential uh, financial crisis, there is a common uh, opportunity for people to come together to form a viable opposition against the Xi first, against the Xi Jinping first. I think that is a very, very likely uh, in years, in you know, this year or next year, in a couple of years to come. Reason being, Xi Jinping made himself um, try. He tried to make some, himself president for life. Uh, he amended the constitution. Uh, um, he removed the uh, term limit last year. That actually a uh, turning point. That uh, triggered a lot of opposition, uh, covert opposition um, within the party. And in two years to come, Xi Jinping will do everything possible to make sure he will enter the third term successfully. But we can only imagine there's so many resistance because uh, um, um, if he su succeeded, he would not share power with his uh, uh, um, comrades in the same generation. He would uh, also um, leave no opportunity for next generation. And give, uh, the, in the past few years, the so-called anti-corruption campaign orchestrated and led by him, um, uh, alienated so many political elite and economic elite in the party. So I think the resistance will be uh, very, very strong. And any, any uh, uh, common opportunity, economic crisis, for example, if Hong Kong demonstration lasts long enough, I think there are going to be some kind of opportunity for people to come together to form a viable opposition against the sea. Once there is a big crack in the party, then the society will react in its own way. So I see the hope in this. Another hope is... Uh, so before we get into that, I have a question. Uh, we've talked before on the show about how there's a factional power struggle between Xi Jinping and the former former leader Jiang Zemin. Yeah. Um, are there more people that uh, are there more factions than just that, or more groups of people, or is it more divided than that? You know, could we see people oh. who have been loyal to Xi Jinping in the past, like Li Keqiang or Wang Yang, in the Politburo Standing yeah. Committee, start to, uh, you know, have these differences of opinion? with Xi Jinping that become problematic for him. Right. And um, I don't see uh, a, a visible faction in the party, but I can only imagine there are so many individuals uh, on top level who um, uh, want to see him fail. And um, take Hong Kong, for example. Uh, um, you know, after the Hong Kongers took to streets in um, early June, I have been talking to my friends back in Beijing. 
I want to understand how these leaders on top, each of them react to Hong Kong the situation. And the, all the information I have got so far point to the fact that everybody's weak. With all the you know evils will be brought to the feet of of Xi Jinping. That means you know everybody's uh, that you own everything, you own power, so you own the problem. When there is a crisis like Hong Kong, you know we just wait. It's not our responsibility, and everybody wish this evil will brought will be brought to Xi Jinping, and it will spell his uh, his down. And um, so that's the major mentality in Beijing. And the economic uh, 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 issue is another one. The trade issue is another one. You know, everybody's just waiting, sitting there without doing anything. Uh, let him to take care. And they want every crisis to spell uh, a failure to him. So uh, that's the mentality. I, you know, I don't see, uh, clearly see factions, but so many individuals. So again, back to the original points that they meet, it takes an opportunity for them to come together. And Xi Jinping himself doesn't even know who will attack him first, from which direction. But there's so many enemies in party, out of party, in the society, in Hong Kong, in Tibet, in uh, Xinjiang, uh, international community, everywhere. And we need opportunity. Uh, so when U.S. has an uh, uh, economic war with China, I think that's very, very um, uh, good opportunity for us. Because um, uh, the economic uh, issue is very important for Xi Jinping. If we can hold economy together, and he still can survive, if there is a major economic crisis, I think that will serve as opportunities for his enemies to come together. So kind of what you're saying is, even though the crimes of the Chinese Communist Party extend way beyond Xi Jinping himself, he may ultimately get the blame for everything. Yes, so earlier you talked about four factors that uh, can lead to nonviolent regime change, and it seems like many of those factors are happening right now in Hong Kong. You've already kind of mentioned it, but how how does Hong Kong play into all of this? Um, Hong Kong is very, very important, not only for Hong Kong itself, but for the entire country of China. And we all watching. Hong Kong is the only place under uh, Xi Jinping's rule, uh, still have the space for this kind of demonstrations. And uh, Hong Kong people have been doing very, very well, very brief, very wise, and um, uh, largely peaceful. And, um, but there, you know, if there's no uh, Beijing, if no Beijing factor, I think uh, Hong Kong already different, or a totally different thing. And the Hong Kong government will give us uh, concessions, will engage a real dialogue with uh, the protesters. But, you know, the recent uh, uh, news uh, by uh, major international media um, revealed that uh, Carrie Lam, the chief executive, um, expressed uh, her willing to resign and regret and all the things. But it's this Beijing that who does not want her to give uh, any confession. So Beijing is still the major factor for the, uh, you know, for the outcome of the protest in uh, Hong Kong. And um, my prediction is um, Xi Jinping will do everything possible to control the situation before October 1st, the 70th uh, National Day of PRC. On this day, he will have a um, massive military parade reviewing. Uh, the government has already announced it would be the largest 
in many decades. He wants to use this opportunity to show a prosperous, harmonious, and a strong China and his leadership. And uh, he wants to use this uh, ceremony to reinforce his position as an authority and challenged by anyone, everyone in the party, in the country, or international community. But Hong Kong people understand very well. So they would not uh, miss this opportunity to focus the international spotlight on Hong Kong issue and also to apply pressure on Xi Jinping. So Xi Jinping would do everything possible to take over. And um, as I described uh, earlier, next two years will be very, very important for Xi Jinping. Uh, it's so important, it, you know, it's, uh, it's um, um, very uh, decisive for him whether, whether he will be successfully enter the third term, then become a king. And every, I can imagine each, every of his enemy in the party, in the society, or even in the international community has extended arm politically and economically in Hong Kong. That means if uh, there's a space for political actions, open political actions in the years to come, we'll see lots, lots of them. Xi Jinping, from his uh, point of view, he would not uh, want Hong Kong to be a base to, for, for opposition against him. So for these reasons, I think he would do everything possible to close down uh, the space for any free political expression in Hong Kong. So what you're saying is basically that Hong Kong will no longer be one country, two systems by October 1st. Yeah. You know, Hong Kong is multiplayer game. I just talked about one player's intention and his tactics. The outcome, the final outcome will not be dominated uh, by any single player, will not be what a single player all is he or her wanted. Uh, I, as far as I have found, the Hong Kong people are so determined, they will not give up. And um, um, just, uh, um, um, just yesterday, um, some news revealed that Cherry Lam's position actually is uh, Wavering, it's not as um, strong as people would uh, think uh, at first. So there's some cracks there. So if we have um, strong enough international support and uh, the strategies that the Hong Kongers are using are right, I think we still have very good chance to win. That means in the end, the Hong Kong government will give concession. I think if we succeed in that way, that would be a major victory for the democracy movement for the entire country. For the entire country, all of China. Yeah, all of China, yeah. So speaking of international pressure, uh, recently you met with Vice President Mike Pence. What did you discuss? Uh, we discussed the religious freedom issue. Um, but of course, uh, during the meeting, uh, Vice President Pence expressed his um, uh, strong position uh, for uh, human rights in China overall, not only the religious freedom. And he also um, 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 told us uh, President uh, Trump is also very on the issue, and he wants to make sure we understand the U.S. government and the people of um, uh, American people are behind us. But, you know, as human rights activists, we uh, think the U.S. have a lot more to do. Um, Magnitsky, Mag Magnitsky uh, Act, for example, 
has not been fully implemented. Um, so we still want the U.S. government to do more, and they should do more. But we really appreciate um, uh, their open support for Hong Kong and for the human rights in China and for you know everything they have done in the past and continue to do. Do you get the sense that the U.S. government is now willing to do more about China than they were before? Uh, mm, I think they are willing to do more than a few years ago. And uh, um, with uh, the trade conflict uh, going on, I think it's a long, will be long-term conflict. Uh, I don't think they can reach any meaningful agreement uh, in any uh, in f- any time soon, uh, so this kind of conflict will spill over to other fields such as uh, security and value, and uh, we believe uh, the, the 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 root cause for all this conflict is the conflict of value. That means if you don't care about the nature of the Chinese government, no matter what you negotiate with this regime, in the end, you will see the, the problems recur. You will do it again and again uh, until, um, I mean, to the point, maybe it's too late. Uh, so um, with this uh, conflict, I think the human rights issue uh, will be uh, elevated. Actually, it is uh, elevated, um, 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 has been elevated um, um, in the uh, for, uh, past two years. And we want this trend to continue. And as I said earlier, uh, the U.S. government can do more. Uh, when they talk about e- uh, economic issue, they should link that with a human rights issue. Uh, we- you know, the, yeah, go ahead. When you were meeting with Vice President Pence, did you get the sense that the concerns for human rights were his own personal values or that this was something broader from the entire Trump administration or U.S. government? Uh, I think, he, uh, of course, the um, um, vice president himself is a human rights person. He's so strong in the universal value and has been um, um, very, very um, outspoken uh, about uh, uh, human rights uh, in China around the world, which I really appreciate it. And I have a very strong sense is it is not only about himself. It is um, uh, about uh, U.S. government and the Congress. And uh, we have been working very closely with uh, quite a few congressional leaders. And not only for the human rights issue, but also for treaty issue, for example. I think uh, some congressional leaders from the other side of the aisle, Democrats, um, uh, even stronger than the White House when it comes to China. So I don't think it is uh, one, it's, uh, but it's one individual issue I mean, it's not a, a one person's issue. It's not about a president or vice president or White House or this administration or just a, a few uh, members of a Congress. I think it's about the entire trend of U.S.-China policy. So what do you think are some specific things the U.S. government could do in Hong Kong or China at large, considering the fact that the Chinese Communist Party often pushes the propaganda that, uh, like, the protest movement in Hong Kong isn't real. It's manufactured by the black hands of the U.S. government. Right. Uh, first of all, the Hong Kong protests are homegrown. We all know that. But the Chinese government tried to smear that so that they can easily mobilize the national uh, sentiment home. Um, to prepare for, you know, any uh, heavy-handed uh, crackdown in uh, Hong Kong. But still, I think a lot of countries have an interest in Hong Kong. Uh, in, even for that, they have to um, support Hong Kong's protest to make sure Beijing will not um, um, uh, 
bring the uh, protest to a bloody land. So the, the voice should be stronger. But there are a lot of specific things the U.S. can do. I mentioned the Magnitsky Act. So they should be prepared to put on the sanction list of officials both in Beijing and Hong Kong who are responsible for the escalating Hong Kong situation, tense and a, a police violence or possible um, a bloody uh, crackdown in Hong Kong. And uh, Hong Kong now is a special uh, tariff region. Um, the U.S., of, there's a um, uh, bill already introduced, which is called the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. Uh, I think you, uh, Congress should pass that as soon as possible. And uh, um, for trade, I think trade should link with Hong Kong. And the uh, Chinese government is eager to reach a trade agreement with the U.S. Uh, because um, the economic downturn, uh, every minute, can bring about an opportunity uh, for you know, oppositions to come together. And that's the major issue, actually, Xi Jinping cares very much, so much, most, cares most. And um, uh, if uh, U.S. take a very, very strong position on trade and the link that with the human rights situation in Hong Kong and China, I think that will play a very, very important, very critical role uh, in the, uh, what we will have in the end. So it's interesting, after everything you said today, that you were once a Communist Party official yourself in China. So how did you go from yep. that to being a democracy activist? Uh, so I, um, I joined the party in the early 80s, um, largely answering uh, Hu Yaobang's call. Hu Yaobang was uh, the open-minded leader, party chief of that time, that time. He called young intellectuals like myself to join the party, to change the party from within. And I believed in that and enticed to join the party, trying to change the system from within. Uh, very soon, I found um, it is the opposite way was working. And it is not we that changed the party. It was the party that changed us. And I found my daily job watching my fellow students and teachers and uh, try to help. You know, I ha had to help the government to control them. So I was disenchanted and left the country to come to the United States to study. And three years after that, the student movement uh, began in Beijing, and I went back. And I joined the movement. I, uh, I witnessed the massacre and narrowly escaped um, and survived the massacre and returned to the United States. Uh, so ever since then, I have been uh, committing myself to doing everything possible to change China peacefully. So that's how it happened. Now, Dr. Yang, there's something interesting that you do that I feel like I don't see a lot of other, um, you know, Chinese human rights activists doing, um, and that's kind of bringing all these different groups together, like you run an interfaith conference for ethnic and religious minorities in China. Could you tell right. us a little bit about that? Yes. And after Tiananmen Square, there, we formed a sort of a, a think tank trying to design for future China. If we you know, don't want this kind of uh, government, what kind of government do we want? What kind of political system we want? We want to answer this question. So we um, organized a lot of scholars to study for future of China, and we came up with the Constitution, which is a federation with um, different degrees of autonomy. I didn't until then realize we have to engage in dialogue with other ethnic groups 
so uh you know uh, before that i had never had any chance to have any kind of interaction with them the tibetans the Uyghurs, mongolians and the people in hong kong and people in taiwan those uh, directly involved with china have a lot a high stake in the future of china so we found the need to uh, dialogue with them. The first group we approached uh, uh, was Tibetans and the Dalai Lama himself. I personally uh, organized uh, um, uh, quite a few uh, dialogues between uh, Chinese and, uh, uh, and the Tibetans. The Dalai Lama himself involved, and uh, he had one dialogue with um, with uh, 400 Chinese scholars in Boston. So um, I was encouraged to for, for, uh, by this development. And um, uh, in, a, in the year 1998 or 1999, I thought I would include, uh, expand the dialogues, include other groups into, um, into uh, this forum. And um, so I launched the internet uh, Interethnic Interfaith Leadership Conference. Um, this conference um, uh, seeks to bring the younger generation leaders from Chinese majority Han, uh, Tibetans, Uyghurs, uh, Mongolians, and the religious groups of so Christians, so Falun Gong practitioners, and the regional group, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, Macau. And you know, it, it soon became a, a annual uh, event. Um, you know, at the very beginning, there was a lot of resentment and um, misunderstanding, mistrust, uh, mainly you know other groups uh, versus the Chinese uh, Han majority. And over years, uh, we um, resolved a lot of differences and come to the understanding that we have to work together. And now there's no problem for us to come together. Uh, you know, not like when we first started, we have to talk about the issue from uh, 2000 years ago. You know, <laughs> five, five years ago, you know. Now we just naturally come together to come to each other's support. And by doing so, of course, we risk uh, being labeled as separatists. You know, I recently was uh, called out by ministry, Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, in its document to the international uh, uh, media. And they smeared me as a separatist and uh, violent riots leader and a spy and bring these people who try to divide China together every year, uh, things like that. But you know how important this um, platform for all of us. And I think uh, we all believe in human rights. And now we just don't worry about uh, after uh, uh, China become a democratic, uh, whether Tibet would be part of China or not, for example, as we used to worry so much. Now, I don't think that's the issue we worry about. We worry about everybody's human rights situation. And uh, we don't have a predetermined position whether you know Taiwan would be part of China in the future or not. But we come together to care for their well-being. And because we all have a high stake in the future of China. So we all understand that we that the Chinese communist regime is our common enemy we have to work on it and uh, so I, I i think it's so important for example when the hong kong uh, uh, uh when hong kongers took to the uh, street those people actually we are in uh, constant communication see uh, try to find a way to help the tibetans uyghurs all come together so now it's become uh, so natural for people to come together it's very important and a positive development. Well, I can see why the Communist Party fears you. I mean, a uh, hundred years ago, uh, Sun Yat-sen 
was, you know, educated in the West and, and spent time in the United States and was able to organize a resistance movement to take down the corrupt Qing dynasty. Mm -hmm. So I think that historical uh, precedent is what the Communist Party is looking at now with this, uh, you know, with your overseas group uh, as, yes. as a potential very significant threat to their stability. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah, we try to. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was going to ask if you thought we were talking earlier about the the viable opposition needing a viable opposition to uh, the current regime. Uh, is that what you're building here? Yeah, we try to build it uh, from overseas, and uh, that will eventually get back to China. And um, yeah, that's what we are building. You're right. You're basically planning the future government of China when the Chinese Communist Party falls. Yes, uh, we do some kind of research on that issue. And also we have um, one concept that is uh, um, substitute, how, how to say it, substitute um, uh, government people. So we have to prepare people who will take over. But, you know, it's very difficult. Uh, we have a very limited resources. And um, the government with um, so big economic power, they go everywhere to corrupt. Uh, even in this country, sometimes I find it very difficult to work with uh, academic institutions, for example. And uh, so we always have an uphill battle to fight. Have you found that the Communist Party's United Front Work Department has tried to infiltrate your organization and yes. interfere with you? Everywhere. Yes. It happens almost every day, everywhere. Like what's an example? Uh, recently, there's a book published in Hong Kong, uh, smearing myself, a lot, a lot of... Um, uh, Make, making up stories. Okay, congratulations, because it means you're doing um, yeah. something right. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of uh, talks uh, on Twitter about this book. And, uh, they, you know, that's one example. Another, they uh, apply tremendous pressure on my family members, which I normally do not want to talk about so much. And uh, so my family is very divided. Um, now, uh, so it's very sad to say, it. and a um, lot of uh, so-called friends come to talk to me almost every day, try to find the information, try to sometimes they try to volunteer to work in our organization, and uh, you know try they try to find out what the U.S. government tried to do through our organization. And uh, you know, just yesterday, um, a classmate of mine a, in junior high who has not uh, been in contact for 40 years, or 30 years, 30 more years, suddenly sent me a message from China and openly trying to uh, be in touch with me and, you know, so friendly. Uh, usually in China, if you don't have such a uh, task from the government, it would be very careful to openly associate it with me. So I just give, uh, you know, you some example, give you some kind of sense of how they work. And my family members in China, um, um, they apply more restrictions on them in recent months. That's that sounds like you've got a big challenge on your plate. Mm. So something I'm asked a lot is, you know, what can people listening who are maybe mostly Americans do to help affect a positive regime change in China? Uh, maybe regime change is the wrong word. <laughs> I think it's the right word. Yeah. What word would you use? Well, no, just because then it's the, it's the, uh, the, the idea that the regime change can comes from, you know, Americans well, people or the CIA. Want to, yeah. Well, people want to help the situation in China, but they don't know how. 
So how can how how can Americans how can somebody listening help? Yes, uh, this is a very very good uh, question. Uh, to answer your question, I have to say I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for people of this country and for you know everything they have done. Without the United States, we don't even have a home now. And um, personally, you know, my I owe my freedom, even my life, to this country. When I was in prison, so many people in this country helped, and I really, really appreciate. I want American people to understand this. So many, many people around the world, especially especially the oppressed people, are looking to U.S as um, a beacon of hope. And, um, you know, that said, I want to say uh, there are a lot of things that American people can help um, Chinese uh, to, to improve their human rights situation. Number one, this is democracy. So the beauty of democracy is the leaders of this country must hear your voice. So you have to make your voice louder. To let your representative hear you about your concern about Hong Kong and China. And this is number one. Number two, you have to get um, um, right information about reality in China to begin with. And um, and and. And wherever you find yourself work, for example, if you're a professor uh, at one of the university, you cannot uh, use, um, uh, you know, academic, this is academic issue as an issue to block those voices, the voices from Chinese dissidents. And um, um, another thing we can do is get information to publish published articles are so important. If you can publish articles about China to educate the American general general, public about the real situation in China, how important China, not only for the people of China, but for the entire world. You know, help the American people understand the human rights issue in China it has a lot to do with the well-being of the people here. I have a lot of love example to share how the Chinese government try to change the democratic way of life here, how they corrupt the democratic way of life here. So actually they affect the life here and of course to link the human rights with the uh, security issue, with the um, uh, trade issue, they are all related. You know, uh, when people talk about trade deficit with China, many people may not understand that China's human rights deficit has contributed largely to the U.S. trade deficit with China. Because with that kind of system, the human rights low, all the costs, for produce are very, very low, so that China is able to dump the cheap good in this country. And not, not uh, let alone a lot, lot of products uh, made by forced labor. Our organization just issued a report last week about forced labor in Xinjiang. Actually, it's happening everywhere in China. So I think a lot of people who understand China should, through their voice, through their uh, publication, to educate the general American public, and that in turn will affect or influence their leaders to make the right China policy. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Yang. Thank you so much. And um, you know, you mentioned sharing information. You know, that's something we try very hard to do on our shows, China Uncensored, and this podcast, China Unscripted. So, as for getting out truthful information about China, you know, 
to those listening, really sharing uh, this content is a way to help spread uh, information and education about China. Now, if somebody wanted to learn more about you and what you do, uh, where can they follow you, Dr. Yang? Uh, they can follow me uh, through Twitter. Uh, my Twitter identity is uh, at yangjianli 1 They also can uh, check our website. That is uh, citizenpowerforchina.org. .org? Yeah. All right. Great. Definitely. Anyone listening, please check that out. And thanks for listening. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Talk to you next time.